This program is brought to you in part by CIE Tours International. For over 80 years featuring all-inclusive tours and go-as-you-please value vacations throughout Ireland and Britain. CIETours.com And by Tourism Ireland, celebrating a special year in Ireland, The Gathering 2013. A year-long, countrywide celebration of music, food, culture, and unique events. Ireland.com and by today you'll find the irish americans where the need is greatest giving time money talent and concern to whomever needs it most contributing as only the irish can to the spirit of america mutual of america your retirement company Hello and welcome. I'm Patricia O'Reilly and I'm delighted you could join us for another edition of Out of Ireland. Coming up on this week's programme. On Staten Island, where a golf course and a new courthouse were built over mass Irish famine graves, plans are underway to memorialise these forgotten victims. But first, for a roundup of the week's news from Ireland, over to RTE. Ireland's National Broadcasting Service. One of the two Anglo-Irish bank executives involved in a taped phone conversation published today has said he deeply regrets that the language and tone he used were imprudent and inappropriate. But John Bow and the other executive involved, Peter Fitzgerald, deny that they or Anglo misled the central bank. The tape from 2008 appears to show that Anglo knew at the time that its request for €7 billion Euro from the central bank would not be enough. So what was happening behind these windows as the bank was collapsing in September 2008? Before now, people speculated, but today, they heard. It's a phone call between the then head of capital markets, John Bow, and then head of retail banking, Peter Fitzgerald. The recording was obtained by the Irish Independent. In it, the pair discussed securing €7 billion Euro of funding from the central bank. That, that number is... Is seven, but the reality is that actually we need more than that. Uh, yeah. But the you know strategy here is you pull them in, you get them to, to write a big check, and they have to keep they have to support their money. You know. Yeah. 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 They have skin in the game. They have to keep. They have, and they've invested a lot. If they saw, if they saw the enormity of it up front, they might decide. They might decide they have a, a choice. You know what I mean? They might say that the cost of taxpayers too high. They also speculate about the future of the bank. What do you think will happen? What do you think will happen? I don't know. Yeah. I really yeah. don't know. I mean, um, I don't think we're an easy sell. No. To anybody. No. Uh, and the, the home interest should be, should be there, except they don't have the financial standing themselves. So do I think it's going to be possible to offload it? No, I don't. This is seven, uh, seven billion bridge. Yeah. So, so, so it's bridged. It's bridged off. We can pay you back, which is never. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Perhaps nervous laughter. The call happened as banks were collapsing around the world. Today, Mr. Bow said. The phone call on September the 18th, 2008, was three days after Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy. He added the intention of Anglo was to borrow money for a number of months before the bank would be able to access sufficient alternate funding. He said, there was no strategy on my part or on the part of anyone else to mislead the central bank. Mr Fitzgerald said in a statement he was not involved in the discussions 
by senior executive management of Anglo with the authorities. He added, I am not, nor have I ever been aware of a strategy to mislead the authorities in relation to the forecasted funding position of Anglo. But the recordings will underscore demands for a full inquiry into what really happened behind these walls in September 2008. David Murphy, RT News. The Taoiseach has told the Doyle he hopes a parliamentary inquiry into the circumstances surrounding the bank guarantee will get underway in the early autumn. He said the inquiry would have to look into what he called the axis of collusion between Anglo-Irish Bank and Fianna Fáil. There was only one question on the minds of opposition groups and as all quizzed the Taoiseach on the fallout from the Anglo tapes published this week by the Irish Independent. The Fianna Fáil leader called for an independent inquiry into the banking crisis, if necessary, chaired by an international judge, giving Mr Kenny a chance to launch into an attack on the last government. And the victims are the tens of thousands of families, ordinary people around this country, who became victims of the axis of collusion between Anglo-Irish Bank and Fianna Fáil and the bankers in general to inflate the property business. Micheál Martin said those comments showed why he was worried about a partisan Oireachtas inquiry, which in any event he said wouldn't be strong enough. It simply cannot make adverse findings in relation to people who are recorded in conversations that have shocked the nation. The ministers. Other speakers asked why, five years on, there'd been no prosecutions arising from what happened. If I go into Don's store and steal to feed my family, I'll end up before the courts. If bankers deliberately defraud the state, boast about it, laugh about it, boast about their meetings with ministers, it'll be OK. The individuals in Anglo, as we know, are only second-rate guys. We need to know how many more scoundrels are locking in the shady vaults of Anglo. And indeed the banks, outer banks including Bank of Ireland, AIB, permanent ESP. The Taoiseach pointed out that a case was due to come to court next year and that the investigation had access to the tapes published by the Irish Independent. I understand that the tapes that are mentioned uh, were part of the material that was supplied to on God the Shikana over four years ago. And he recalled a briefing he was given by Anglo as opposition leader shortly after the bank guarantee. All of that presentation was a tissue in a fabrication of untruths. The Taoiseach said he hoped the Oireachtas inquiry into banking could be underway by the early autumn. The Irish economy is back in recession. The latest figures from the Central Statistics Office show the economy shrank in the second half of last year and continued to contract in the first three months of this year. The main reason? Economic weakness in the rest of Europe, which sharply hit Ireland's export performance. So it's official. The economy is back in recession. And it's almost entirely due to a fall in exports, because most of our main trading partners are in recession too, and are buying less of the stuff we want to sell them. It's fragile. We know that it's still creating jobs, so I don't think the economy is tumbling back into prolonged weakness, but it is telling us it's going to be a very slow struggle, and we're not going to see very significant growth in the next year. It really does raise a question. How delicate has the next budget to be? We've long been told that Ireland would have an export-led recovery from the crash of 2008, and that was the case up until last summer, when the Eurozone slipped into recession. But while exports have been declining pretty much all year, the fall in the first three months of this year of 3% was one of the biggest on record. The bad weather effect on agribusiness was serious and some big pharmaceutical products came off patent, making them unattractive to make in Ireland. While physical goods made in factories have been declining as a share of exports, digital products and services such as Google have been growing and taking their place. But even this growth has slowed. The other big downturn was in personal consumption spending, which accounts for around half of GDP. It fell by 3% in the post-Christmas, post-budget, bad weather first quarter, which, combined with the poor export performance, kept the economy in recession.
Survivors of the Magdalen laundries will receive payments of up to €100,000 each, along with a state pension under a compensation scheme announced today. It's estimated that the scheme will cost between €35 and €58 million. Euro. The Minister for Justice, Alan Shatter, also said he hoped religious congregations would respond constructively. Finally, recognition of their incarceration, misery and unpaid work. The words used by Mr Justice John Quirk in drawing up this report, which the government says will be implemented in full. Survivors will get tax-free payments of between €11,500 and €100,000. Based on their length of stay, starting at three months, with the maximum applying to ten years or more. It promises to be a speedy, non-adversarial process. Women will also get the state contributory pension, or, if they're younger, €100 Euro per week, recognising their work in the laundries, along with enhanced medical cards. The Magdalen Survivors Together group have rejected the offer as inadequate, and they also criticise the fact that lump sums over €50,000 would be paid weekly. And I'm 78 years of age. I can't go on much, much, much longer. I'm getting fed up with it. You know, because it's very emotional and I was very disappointed today, like, you know. But other advocates were pleased. We've asked for a fair, reasonable and just settlement. I believe that this forms the basis of that. I think it, the essence of it is going to be quick. Justice Minister Alan Shatter said the religious congregations involved were expected to contribute. I think there will be very great disappointment within Cabinet if the congregations failed to contribute. I, I think perhaps um, the taxpayers of Ireland would expect they would make a contribution. This evening the four orders of nuns said they would assist. Government will be keenly watching how long this takes. Sandra Hurley, RTE News. For more on this, we're joined in studio by our religious and social affairs correspondent, Joe Little. Joe, as we've seen there, some of these women visibly disappointed. Why is that? Women uh, would value very much lump sums rather than having this spun out in the form of pensions and so on because, uh, let's face it, in the case of many of them, they don't have many years to go and they feel that with a lump sum, for instance, their families would benefit from the residue of a lump sum, whereas the benefit would really die with them if uh, they were depending on a pension. So there is that preference for lump sums. On the other hand, the Justice for Magdalene's group has welcomed very warmly uh, the taking on board by Justice Quirk of many of their suggestions, but it has emphasised the need to advertise strongly the existence of this scheme so that people, especially in the diaspora in the United States, Canada, Australia and so on, as well as in Britain, uh, where uh, Councillor Sally Mulready is working very hard with the network of women, should be made aware of the fact that the scheme is there and they've welcomed in particular the fact that the scheme is still open and that the Department of Justice has a helpline to which they can refer. Okay, Joe Little, thank you. A Fine Gael TD has described the recent Erechthus hearings on the protection of life during pregnancy bill as a charade. Brian Walsh, who's voting against the legislation, accused the government of ignoring all the expert evidence in the area of abortion when a woman's life is at risk from suicide. While several Fine Gael TDs are still said to be deciding if they can support this bill, one who will not made it clear today why he will vote against it. The contents of this bill, as so far as they pertain to suicidality, have been hammered out between the parties of government around the Cabinet table. And what we have as a result has been decided on the basis of what is best for the politician, the Labour politician in particular, rather than what is best for the mother and child. But one of those Labour TDs said she was not happy with everything in the bill. To my mind, it's draconian that a woman or a girl can face a 14-year prison sentence for, terming, for terminating a pregnancy. One Fine Gael TD also called for greater clarity in the legislation. I have concerns in relation to rights of the father, and it's something we need explained and defined in a more clear way. A number of Fine Gael TDs still concerned about the bill met the Taoiseach today. In fairness, he did answer a lot of my questions, which were personal, and um, I have to take it on board now and, and see what way I'm going to vote. Michal Lahan, RTE News, Leinster House.
A group of Irish bingo fans got more than they bargained for after they were arrested by police in Portugal for playing a few rounds in a local pub. The British owner of the Yorkshire Tavern in Albufeira received a fine and a suspended prison sentence for organising what police described as illegal gambling. Clickety-click, almost in the nick. And all for a top prize of biscuits, an English breakfast and a chocolate bar. It was almost a full house at the Yorkshire Tavern pub in the Portuguese city of Albufeira at the weekend, where Irish and British expats had gathered for their weekly bingo night. Unluckily for some, the bar was raided by police after they received an anonymous tip-off about illegal gambling. Everyone in the venue was arrested and bussed to a local police station for questioning. 28 of them appeared in court where they received fines of up to 700 euro and suspended sentences of three months. In Portugal, anyone organising bingo must apply for a licence from the government. And without that permit, it's the end of the road for the game at the Yorkshire Tavern, where the proceeds from last week's contest have been seized as evidence by police. The winner's biscuits were also confiscated, but he did manage to escape with the chocolate. Sharon Gaffney, RTE News. The President, Michael D. Higgins, and his wife, Sabina, hosted an event at Ora San Uthoron tonight to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the inauguration of Ireland's first president under Bunroth Naheran. Mr. Higgins said all nine occupants had added to the presidency. Two past presidents and the current office holder at Ora San Uthoron tonight along with relatives of the six others who served, including Patrick Hillary's family. A time of celebration and reflection. Dedicate yourself uh, to protect and to advance the welfare of the people of Ireland to the best of your abilities. And I believe that both my immediate predecessors, Presidents Macaulay and Robinson, but all of the occupants of the office have in their own way uh, considerably added to the presidency. The role has evolved since 1937 from being conservative and ceremonial to one with a broader reach. I was elected as a president who was going to do it differently and I felt the huge honour but also the weight of responsibility. How am I going to do it? Because up to then the office had been very constrained by tradition, not by the constitution. While others highlighted themes for their tenure. One granddaughter of a president remembers visiting the Oris as a child. Oh, well, a very large place, um, rather intimidating, but one just played games and um, Commandant Butler, who was the aide-de-camp, was um, involved with keeping an eye on us children. Today marks the 75th anniversary of Douglas Hyde taking office. Sandra Hurley, RTE News, Orison Uchtheron. news from Ireland was, as usual, brought to you by RTE, Ireland's national broadcasting service. And now, Staten Island in New York is not a place that many people would associate with Irish famine emigrants. However, countless numbers of them were buried here in unmarked graves. Now it's hoped that a memorial can be built to remember these victims. This is the last call. Ellis Island in New York Harbour has long stood as a symbol of Irish immigration to the US. A statue of Annie Moore, who arrived from Cove in County Cork, the first emigrant to be processed here in 1892, takes pride of place today at the facility. But less well known is the story of nearby Staten Island. During the peak years of Irish immigration to the US, in the years following the famine of the 1840s, tens of thousands of the sick and their families who elected to join them were brought here to a hospital and quarantine station. Many were never to leave and were buried in unmarked graves, close by where today the Staten Island Ferry Terminal is located. Before Ellis Island, there was Castle Gardens, also known as Castle Clinton, and then there was Hofbourne and Swinburne Islands. But between 1799 and 1858, um, massive immigration was through the Marine Hospital Quarantine Station here on Staten Island. All ships entering to New York Harbor during that time period 
were stopped, an inspector, a health inspector, went to each ship and inspected for infectious disease. If found, those individuals or families were taken off the ships and brought into quarantine here on Staten Island by about where the Staten Island Ferry is today. And hundreds of thousands of Irish famine immigrants were taken off ships and quarantined in the facility on Staten Island. Many of them died. I would have to say most of them died. Very few people actually got better. And if they got better from their disease, there's a good chance they caught something else. You know, the survival rate was low in that facility. Upon death, they were taken out of their beds with just the sheeting or the bedding that they had, and they were immediately buried unceremoniously. No death certificates were issued. No cemetery log was kept, and they were buried in what is known as mass graves. The huge hospital and quarantine facility stretched from the Staten Island Ferry up into the hills of Staten Island. The dead were buried in two cemeteries close by, soon forgotten as the island developed. The larger cemetery was covered by a golf course in the 1920s and the smaller one as a parking lot in the 1950s. The largest of the two cemeteries with tens of thousands of Irish famine victims were buried became a large municipal golf course in the 1920s where today it's a beautifully manicured golf course and underneath it is an intact cemetery. In the 1950s, where today is the new Supreme Courthouse complex, was one of the original smaller cemeteries. And in the 1950s, the city of New York leveled it, which means they brought in bulldozers and backhoes, and they obliterated the cemetery. And one of the members of the Friends of Abandoned Cemeteries, a woman who's in her 90s now, witnessed in the 1950s dump trucks filled with human remains driven down by where the Staten Island Ferry is today, right into New York Harbor, dumping the remains of the Irish famine immigrants into New York Harbor. It's been long known that unmarked mass graves existed on Staten Island. But it was only in 2003, with plans underway to build a new courthouse over one of the sites, that an organization called Friends of Abandoned Cemeteries finally stepped in. After lengthy negotiations with local authorities, some remains were exhumed. Following DNA testing, all were found to be of Celtic origin. The community and the island was always aware that the remains were at this site. Uh, but when the courthouse was announced nearly 10 years ago, we knew that desecration was going to happen once again. They were going to overturn these gravesites, dig them up without any consideration, and they were going to pave over them again. We knew that we had to rally our community, rally the support of everyone that was involved with those remains, and make sure that this didn't happen ever again. We begged and pleaded with the local politicians, the state assembly people, to fight with us to make sure that this didn't happen. And that's when they decided that the archeologists would come in, they checked certain areas to determine how large a site we were looking at. So some of the smaller testing areas uncovered remains of women, children, men, partial remains, full body remains. But then that also triggered an entire site search to put a parameter around the entire perimeter of this location to make sure that there was nothing left uncovered and that all of the remains were discovered so that at a later date, we could exhume all of those remains, store them, and ultimately memorialize them. The people that are buried at this site don't have a voice today, and that's what Friends of Abandoned Cemeteries is all about, is to provide a voice, to provide a mouthpiece for those who cannot defend themselves any longer, and to make sure that the site that was given to them for their final resting place is one that's there forever, it's not desecrated, and it is one that is honored and memorialized each and every year. It's hoped that the exhumed remains and any more that can be found will be reinterred in a memorial green near the new courthouse complex. After 160 years of neglect, maybe this generation can ensure that these famine victims will not be forgotten. The ancient order Hibernians feel that these people were buried unceremoniously after their transatlantic voyage and illness. Uh, their interment was just haphazard, thrown together in a potter's field, a common grave. It's our position that they should be shown proper respect, have proper burial, have a proper uh, uh, memorial established for them, so that they can be remembered not only by the Irish, but everyone here on Staten Island, and shown the proper respect 
that every, gener every culture shows for their deceased, whether they're Native American or any other culture throughout the world. These people died here on Staten Island after trying to get to America, their hope, their dream. Now we're trying to make sure that they are remembered here on Staten Island where they died. Millions of Irish Americans can trace an ancestor that came to this country during the years of the famine. You know, there's Irish memorials all over this country, you know, as honorable as that is. But here on Staten Island, we have the remains, the actual physical bones of these Irish immigrants. So more than any place in the United States, I think it's important to memorialize the famine Irish here on Staten Island. So hopefully the efforts to erect a memorial on Staten Island will be successful. Well, that's it for another week here on Out of Ireland. And don't forget to join us at the same time next week. But for now, from all of us here, I'm Patricia O'Reilly. Take care, and we'll see you soon. This program is brought to you in part by CIE Tours International. For over 80 years featuring all-inclusive tours and go-as-you-please value vacations throughout Ireland and Britain. CIETours.com and by Tourism Ireland, celebrating a special year in Ireland, The Gathering 2013. A year-long, countrywide celebration of music, food, culture, and unique events. Ireland.com And by... Today you'll find the Irish Americans where the need is greatest. Giving time, money, talent, and concern to whomever needs it most. Contributing as only the Irish can to the spirit of America. Mutual of America, your retirement company.